So he's finished his second broadcast talk in terms of what Christians believe. They believe that there really is a God, there really is evil. This evil has come through this agent called the evil one who is now in control, as it were, of this part of the world. And we now find ourselves in enemy-occupied territory. The third broadcast talk, the shocking alternative. Christians then believe that an evil power has made himself for the present the prince of the world. Is this state of affairs in accordance with God's will or not? If it is, he is a strange God. You will say, if he is not, then how can anything happen contrary to the will of a being with absolute power? Again, we're back to the problem of evil. And he goes on into a discussion of what we call the free will argument. And I'm not going to take time to go into it here. You can read it in Mere Christianity. It's even dealt with more fully in his book, The Problem of Pain. The important thing is, is that all Christians believe that evil is real and that evil has come about by contrary choice, choice against what is good. He says, when we have understood about free will, we shall see how silly it is to ask, as somebody once asked me, why did God make a creature of such rotten stuff that we went wrong? The better stuff, and this is his answer, the better stuff a creature is made of, the cleverer and stronger and freer it is, then the better it will be if it goes right. But also the worse it will be if it goes wrong. A cow cannot be very good or very bad. A dog can be both better and worse. A child better and worse still. And an ordinary man still more so. A man of genius still more so. A superhuman spirit best or worst of all. <coughs> Psalm 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we really don't know what a fully functioning human being looks like the beauty and the glory of it, because it's muted because of sin. But the capacity for good is something we cannot imagine. But the capacity for evil is correspondingly great, you see. My little Libby, a Scottish Terrier, can be vicious when it comes to squirrels and rabbits. But Libby does not think up ingenious ways of torturing people. We do. But Libby cannot be nearly as good as anyone in this room can be. And that is Lewis's point. He raises the question, how did the dark power go wrong? A reasonable guess, based on our own experience of going wrong, which we have quite a bit of, the moment you have a self at all, there is the possibility of putting yourself first, wanting to be the center, wanting to be God. In fact, what Satan put into the heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could be like gods, be their own masters, invent some sort of happiness for themselves outside God, apart from God. And out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empire, slavery. The long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. Again, that's the Christian angle on all of this. The reason why it can never succeed is this. God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. Now God designed a human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. Think with me of a kite. A kite was designed to fly in the air. It was designed to do that by being upheld by wind that's tethered to a string that a person, a human being, holds on down here. All of its glory, all of its reason for being, is absolutely dependent on being tethered. You let go of that string, what happens to the kite? It dies. It was never intended to function apart from the tether. 
We were created tethered to God. And what Lewis is saying, what the evil one did was he tempted us to believe we could live without the tether and we cut it. And nothing has been the same since. Our ability, our ability to function freely has everything to do with that tether. We cannot function freely the way God intended. We hurt one another. We were not intended to do that. A kite cannot function without the tether. They are trying to run it on their own juice, the wrong juice. That is what Satan has done to the human race. And what did God do? And here we're beginning to move into the heart of Christianity. First of all, he left us conscience, the sense of right and wrong. And all through history there have been people trying, some of them very hard, to obey it. None of them quite succeeded. And secondly, he sent the human race what I call good dreams. I mean those queer stories scattered all through the heathen religions about God who dies and comes to life again and by his death has somehow given new life to men. In literature they're called myths. Thirdly, he says, he selected one particular people and spent several centuries hammering into their heads the sort of God he was, the Jews. And there was only one of him and that he cared about right conduct. That is what they taught him. There's only one God, it's him, and he cares about right conduct. Those people were the Jews and the Old Testament gives us an account of the hammering process. In other words, God was creating a context, a human context, for this one that the world had been waiting for to come, the Savior, that all these good dreams had been talking about, as far back as you go, <coughs> embodied in all the old religions. Then comes the real shock. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. He says he has already always existed. He says he is coming to judge the world at the end of time. Now let us get this clear. Among pantheists, like the Indians, anyone might say that he is part of God, or one with God. <coughs> Excuse me. And there would be nothing very odd in that context about it. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not mean that kind of God. God in their language meant the being outside the world who had made it and was infinitely different from anything else in it. And when you have grasped that, you will see that what this man said was quite simply the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. One part of this claim tends to slip past us unnoticed because we have heard it so often that we no longer see what it amounts to. I mean the claim to forgive sins. Now I'm just going to take a break here and instead of moving in with um, what Lewis does, I'm going to do a similar thing but actually use a biblical text. And it's Mark 2. And it's the story of the paralytic. Because there's something really important here because you know, I've heard Christians often say, why didn't Jesus just come out and say he was God? It really make the whole thing a lot easier. Well, folks, he did. Over and over and over and over again in that context. And that is exactly why they crucified him. That was his heresy. John chapter 10. Jesus says, what, what sin are you going to stone me for? He said, no sin, but for you, a mere man, make yourself out to be God. In Mark chapter 2, you have these friends. They've got this paralytic. Jesus heals people. They want to give him a chance to get healed, but it's just too crowded. So they find their way up on top of this roof. <clears throat> now this is a dirty business. If you've ever been on these roofs, I mean, it's not an easy thing to, to create a hole big enough to drop a person through. But they finally do it. These people are serious. They really want their friend healed. They drop this dude down. Jesus looks at him. What's everybody waiting for? To heal him. And what does Jesus say? <laughs> Your sins are forgiven. You know, and they're all going, Jesus, that's really nice, but I mean, we didn't, we didn't put this hole in the roof for you to say your sins are forgiven. We want you to heal this dude. Now, that's one story, but there's another story going on. The leaders, the religious leaders, the political and religious leaders are there, and they're talking among themselves. And you know what they're talking about? 
this guy's a blasphemer because he's just a man and he's taking divine prerogative. Only God can forgive sins. Okay? Now Jesus knows what they're talking about. The text makes it clear because he turns to me and says, you want to know that I have the authority to forgive sins? What's easier? To say your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Well, it's much easier to say your sins are forgiven because it does not require any demonstration. It's much harder to say rise up and walk because if the guy doesn't get up and walk, then there's something wrong. And Jesus says, so that you may know that I have the authority to forgive sins. He says, rise up and walk. And the guy gets up and everybody goes, whoa. What does he leave these people to believe he meant? What would you think if you heard that? That this guy's claiming to be God. There's no way around it. Now if he is just a man and a righteous man, you don't do that. You do not deliberately confuse people. And he did it over and over again. It just frustrated them no end. And I have a lot of sympathy for these people. People just don't do that. If I came down in downtown D.C. and said, you know, I'm going to send all my angels from heaven and I'm going to do all these things, you'd think I'm some wacko. Jesus does it and somehow we think, okay, it's all right. It isn't. They didn't think it was all right. I'm trying, he says, as he finishes up, to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Now what's very interesting is that the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, a very, very important book was written, The Quest for the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer. Schweitzer was a trained theologian before he ever became a medical doctor. And all these, these lives of Jesus had been written, hundreds of them, French, Spanish, German, English, all claiming to have found the real historical Jesus. Because once you get rid of the supernatural Jesus, which naturalism says it doesn't exist, so there's just got to be a human being, who is this human being? Will the real Jesus please stand up? Schweitzer went through all of those and he says, you know, you're not any closer than the church. You've just made a modern Jesus who is no more comfortable in that period of time than he is here. And the way he concluded was, you know, this Jesus, he really was a man who believed that he was God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He really believed it and was sincere with all of his heart, but he was just sincerely wrong. He thought he could take the wheel of the world and turn it in, in a way that would bring all humanity with it. But he didn't. In fact, the opposite. The wheel crushed him. And that's the end of the story of the historical Jesus. The story of the Jesus of faith is something different. Now, I really appreciate Schweitzer because of the honesty in which he went after that question. Because he said, if you just leave it for what Jesus says, what we have, there's really any, only one conclusion. You cannot make him some modern moral teacher. He goes now in his fourth broadcast talk to the heart of it, what we call the atonement. God has landed on his, this enemy-occupied world in human form, the incarnation. And now, what was the purpose of it all? What did he come to do? about his death and his coming to life again. 
It is obvious that Christians think the chief point of the story lies here. The main thing is his death and coming back to life, being suffering and being killed, and not simply as an example, but something that accomplishes something real. Now he says, before I became a Christian, I was under the impression that the first thing Christians had to believe was one particular theory about this dying. What I came to see later was that neither this theory nor any other theory is the thing itself. The central Christian belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. Theories as to how it did this are another matter. A good many different theories have been held as to how it works. There's satisfaction theory, penal substitution, Christus Victor, and they're all ways at trying to explain this historical event that has put us right with God. Theories about Christ's death are not Christianity. They are expla explanations about how Christianity works. Christians would not all agree as to how important these theories are, but I think they will all agree that the thing itself is infinitely more important than any explanations that theologians have produced. I think they would probably admit that no explanation will be ever quite adequate to its reality. He's not saying that the explanations aren't important. We have to try to sort this out. And all of them are useful at some level. The important thing is all Christianity agrees is that what Christ accomplished in his life, suffering, death, and resurrection was to bring salvation, to put us right with God. He goes on and he, he actually describes one of the ones that has been most helpful to him, what's called the penitential theory. And I'm not going to go into that, you can read it yourself. But he ends this way here. He says, but supposing God became a man. Suppose our human nature which can suffer and die was amalgamated with God's nature in one person. Then that person could help us. He could surrender his will and suffer and die because he was man. And he could do it perfectly because he was God. You and I can go through this process only if God does it first in us. But God can do it only if he becomes a man. Our attempts at this dying will succeed only if we men, us humans, share in God's dying. But we cannot share in God's dying unless God dies. And he cannot die except by being a human being. That is the sense in which he pays our debt and suffers for us what he himself need not suffer at all. And again, what he's trying to summarize is that whether you go to Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant doctrine, <clears throat> this bit is there. We all agree that God became a human being to do what we could not do on our behalf. And he was able to do it in the way he did because he was God. I've heard some people complain that if Jesus was God as well as man, then his sufferings and death lose all value. They're not real. Because it must have been so easy for him. And I think it's worth taking a moment here to look at this. He goes in, and, and you should read it, because he does a very nice job <clears throat> of showing that one really doesn't understand how difficult something is until they really try and go through it. Let me give you a quick illustration to try to get there. I come from Oregon. We have a 100, 150 foot hemlock dug fir. When a storm goes through those things, it sounds like a train's coming through your back door. And when they fall, it's big. Let's say a storm's going through. I went through one of these called Typhoon Frida. And let's say you just look out and square miles is this forest and the storm starts coming 60 miles an hour, the weak trees go down. 80 miles an hour, more go down. 100 miles an hour, they're really starting to topple. Night comes. It rages and peaks in the middle of the night. Dawn breaks, you wake up and as far as you can see, square miles, everything is flattened but one tree. And the question is, of all the trees in the forest, which one knows the full force of the storm? The one standing. The real truth is we have no clue what Jesus went through. We topple over at 40 miles an hour. We don't know what it's like to resist evil to the point where it causes me physically to rupture vessels in my head and sweat blood. 
Jesus went all the way. So Lewis, again, through all of this, is also trying to disabuse us of certain issues. <clears throat> he concludes the fifth talk called The Practical Conclusion. <clears throat> and let me just briefly, a couple of things here. He says, <clears throat> how then is this death and life passed on to us? He's talking now about how it's lived out in the Christian life. How is this done? Now please remember how we acquired the old, ordinary kind of life. We, we uh, derived it from others, from our father, mother, and all our ancestors, without our consent. And by a very curious process involving pleasure, pain, and danger. A process you would never have guessed. Now the God who arranged that process is the same God who arranges how the new kind of life, the Christ life, is to be spread. We must be prepared for it to be odd too. <clears throat> Again, what I'm going to do is just briefly summarize what he does here. And if you want two biblical texts to go to, to root this, Romans chapter 5 verses 12 through 21, and 1 Corinthians 15 verses 21 and 22. And basically what it's saying is that it begins with this couple of human beings, which the scripture call Adam and Eve. And what it says is all of us are, as it were, in embryo in them. When they fall, we all fall. Now we don't like that, do we? Why should we have to pay for the dirty deed of Adam and Eve? But do we ever think about the fact that you have another person later in history that does the dirty deed and we benefit from it. That is why liberal theology viewed substitution on the cross as immoral and rejected it. But the way things are is because God has so constituted all of us to be in this couple, as it were, he is justified and it is right to be able to do it again over here. So just as we all fall in Adam, so we can all be raised in Christ. All who are in the first Adam, as it were, die. That's what Paul says in Romans. And we inherit sin, death, condemnation. But if you let go of that relationship by faith, turn and embrace the new Adam, the new beginning, we get everything that he has. Life, righteousness, goodness. And you can't have the one without the other, folks. You can't have your cake and eat it too. That's what Lewis tries to bring out here. That's what Paul brought out. You die here, and really moving to faith, this whole idea of a personal sort of movement, is just a decision of saying, yes, I inherited this. I inherited these propensities in me that don't produce life but death, conflict, jealousy, envy, all of these things. I let go of that. I repent of those things and I turn and I brace this new start for the human race. And I inherit all that this one has. And I begin to move towards that image now and away from this image. That is how he concludes this last talk. That is why the Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good. But the Christian thinks any good he does comes from the Christ life inside him. He does not think that God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. And I'll end with that. Tomorrow we pick up the third one and we begin to look at Christian behavior or Christian ethics. So thank you for this evening.